Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Thing as a Fish. Before we start, if you don't have plans in the next couple of weeks and you live in the Scottish area, then you must come and see our show. We will be in Inverness, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow between the 31st of August and the 4th of September and you will not regret it. It is such a fun night with all sorts of facts and silliness and just messing around. There'll be a prize for someone on the stage. I can't give you any more details about that but if you're in scotland and you'd like to come and see the show then go to no such things of fish.com slash live and the details are there we also have a show coming up in cardiff on the 13th of september which i think is very nearly sold out if it's not already sold out and we have a show in london on the 9th of september now that is sold out but you can see it virtually so there are virtual audience tickets available for that and if you would like to get those or indeed the tickets for cardiff then again go to no such things of fish.com slash live thank you very much to everyone who's joined club fish in the last few weeks um we're having a whole great amount of fun behind that velvet rope with loads of bonus material and ad free episodes if you are interested in joining club fish then do go to no such things of fish.com slash apple or no such things of fish.com slash patreon for more about that but as i always say in this situation the main podcast will always 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 be free and that free podcast is just about to begin okay so on with the podcast Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast coming to you from the QI offices in Covent Garden. My name is Dan Schreiber. I'm sitting here with James Harkin, Anna Tashinsky, and Andrew Hunter Murray. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is. James. Okay, my fact this week is that in the 1930 World Cup semi-final between the USA and Argentina, the American medic accidentally chloroformed himself and had to be carried off. (laughs) (laughs) It's very funny. And it raises for me a lot of other questions like who was he trying to chloroform? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that a legitimate tactic? <laughs> and was it like a classic like uh, movie where the bank robber or whoever is trying to steal someone puts the rag over the mouth? Was yeah. he like holding his face? <laughs> I mean, there is so much wrong with this fact, I think. <laughs> and, and we might go into all of it, but it's basically, it's on the FIFA website. So I think it, it counts as a fact for us. Yeah. But I can't see it mentioned in any contemporary part. And... Chloroform doesn't really work like that. This right. is an incredible self drive by on your own face. I know. <laughs> I know. So he was called J- Jack Cole, is that right? Jack Cole, yeah. yeah. And there are a few versions of events, aren't there? So yeah, one yeah. is that he ran on the pitch trying to help another player. And then his th- thing broke in his bag, and he had chloroform in his bag, and then yeah. that broke, and then the fumes the must- fumes raised and yeah, 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 yeah. knocked him out. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one, one version. Another version is that he went onto the pitch to argue with the referee about something <laughs> and threw a bottle of chloroform onto the ground in anger, oh, and then it good. came up and the fumes <laughs> knocked him out. That's a red card. That's a red card for the header. <laughs> <laughs> um, the earliest I've managed to trace the story back is to a journalist called Brian Glanville. Uh, and a lot of people think he's the greatest football writer of all time. He's really, really famous. But he was born in 1931, so he couldn't have been at this match. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is on the FIFA website. And But the other yeah. thing is, if you look at contemporary reports from the newspapers at the time, it's not mentioned. And I found an interview with Jack Cole, which was done about 15 years later, and he doesn't mention it in that interview. You might so. not, though, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. amazing. It is amazing. The self-knockout is just phenomenal, right? <laughs> <laughs> like it's one of those things where you don't know what to do when you see someone do it and um, ash who wrote the theme tune for our mm. song he once was in a bar fight it's very weird ash was in a bar exactly fight. you can't quite imagine it and he's the most zen person he's so ever. zen so this was i guess just pre-zen just pre-zen right, ash right, right. and um he went for the first punch against these other people wow and he took the swing and as he took the swing he took a step forward slipped 
fell on the ground, knocked himself out, <laughs> oh. and that was end of fight. It Is that like, his only ever fight? Yeah, he KO'd himself on the Amazing. first go. Yeah. So he actually has a 100% record of knocking someone out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One win, one loss uh, yeah. in his only match. Uh, another source I found this is a book called Angels with Dirty Faces by Jonathan Wilson, which is the best book that I've ever read on um, South American football. Cool. And he mentions it in that. <laughs> it's like such a big qualifier. Yeah. Like, this is the best book I've ever read is what they'll use on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this generally, so we, we haven't really properly said, but 1930 World Cup was the very first ever Ooh. World Cup. And it was set up because the Olympics weren't taking football seriously and they weren't having it as recognized as an official sport. So this was set up in South America. But as a result of that distance, it meant that a lot of countries around the world didn't come and play because the journey there and the journey mm. back as well as the subsequent tournament would mean they were out of play for like three months, which didn't work with their local tournaments yeah. and so on. Yeah. Also expensive for yeah. a lot of countries. So yeah. nice And also country. the home countries, so England, uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, they thought that actually really they were more important than FIFA and so they had their own kind of home nations tournament and they didn't really see this as a proper World Cup so yeah. they weren't in it So I read that the American team mm. who were playing in this semi-final was mostly made up of English and Scottish professional football mostly scottish i, I yeah. did a, i did a count i made it to be five scottish players and one english player that's um, a lot it is a lot yeah. it's more than you're normally allowed i, th I don't know <laughs> what I'm about, i think oh well and um cole was irish i think wasn't was he? he yeah was uh, he? in fact he was irish brought up in scotland and he'd just gone to america to track down his father who'd run out on him <laughs> and he found himself in america and they were like god are you from the british isles yeah would you mind playing for us wow. but it's weird because america were quite good then so i don't know why they had to poach this was like a heyday for america American football yeah. and it sort of plummeted after this because of the football wars or the soccer wars I think where What's that? they it's so unexciting it's the most boring <laughs> war ever oh, okay. it's like there were two um everyone bodies. just chloroformed themselves <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um no there were two bodies trying to manage football who were competing with each other it was oh. like the um, USFA and the ASL and they fought so much that everyone was like well this is, this is tedious you're all arguing so much and the depression came which didn't help so and the um the American team they were known by the French as the shot putters because they were so big. They were like really big, yeah. strong players. Uh, but they got battered in this game. They lost 6-1 to Argentina. Mm. And one of the reasons might have been because one of the players got a broken leg yeah. uh, in yeah. the first half. I so <laughs> don't believe this. Look, I've seen people with broken legs and it's really painful. It was a guy called Ralph Tracy and apparently afterwards he was diagnosed with that. But I reckon it was a tiny chipped bone are you, say, are you saying he played on? Yeah. yeah, he played on the whole game. He got broken no. leg yeah, really early on. It was really weird because they there was another player, Andy Old, who ripped his lip open. Yeah. And the problem was is that there were no sort of proper rules about how you could treat the wound. And so right. he played the rest of a match with a rag in his mouth to sort of stem the bleeding. <laughs> Unfortunately, that rag had got chloroform. <laughs> 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 yeah, and so basically they were a good team, but they, they basically got beaten from pillar to post. Uh, yeah. And in the end, by the second half, they really were just hobbling around and the Argentinians wow. absolutely battered them. Yeah. Although quite nice that they, because it was 6-1 and America scored their goal in the last, in the 89th mm. minute, Did I think. They? Yeah. I mean, well, you oh. think kind of, what's the point? Why are you still no, trying great. at that point? It's a bit of honor. Yeah. yeah. In the final, which was Argentina versus Uruguay, um, Uruguay won that final and in Argentina they kicked off uh, the Uruguayan embassy was attacked Whoa. Uh, they did a morning parade through Buenos Aires uh, and two people were reportedly shot for not saluting as the parade went past Ooh. oh my god, god. amazing oh, one newspaper said that since um, they'd lost Argentina probably it meant that international football tournaments were a bit useless so they should just never do them ever again uh, and eight players from that Argentinian team never played for the country ever again wow, wow. Yeah, this were... feels like it's about you know in a marriage where you have a massive fight about where you keep the spoons it's not about not about the spoons really i don't think it's about with the me spoons. it actually always is about where you keep spoons because <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think it's a very clear place where they should be yeah and he's yeah. like to his wife you've had an affair she's like this is about the spoons isn't it <laughs> yes it's about the spoons <laughs> 
Um, yeah, there was a ref called John Langanus. Langanus, and I think he, it's pronounced Long Anus. Long Anus. <laughs> Sorry. So yeah. I imagine that's what the fans sung to him. <laughs> yeah, John Long Anus. Long John Anus. Um, <laughs> He, he was Belgian, right? <laughs> yes. And he was the head ref of the... So he was the one who officiated the final. Yeah. And um, he was really worried about... The, the, the tensions were running really high, as James mm. says, like even post the match. So one of the Argentinian players, Luis Monti, he got a death threat sent. And the referee demanded a quick escape route oh, to I get back this. to his he ship. Wanted, not, yeah. not a secret tunnel, but as near as damn it, a safe passage. Exactly. His, because yeah, he yeah, saw yeah. whatever call he makes. And so this, if Long he gets... asked for a safe passage, did he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it did sound like it was a bit of an intense yeah, atmosphere, yeah. And, it's still... um, and there was a controversial goal in that final as well. Oh, so right, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Luis Monti, for instance, he was like the hard man of the Argentinian defense, uh, but he did get this death threat. And afterwards, there was a suggestion in the Argentinian media that it was one of the Uruguayan players who rang him up with a silly voice and said he was going to kill oh, him. Really? And um, but in the end, he still played. He didn't think he was going to play, but all the way through, he would kind of. In great, try and ingratiate himself with the crowd so whenever a Uruguayan player went down he would sort of go and help them up and stuff like what, that. What in the hope that the guy who was going to kill him with the, <laughs> holding the revolver somewhere in the crowd thought oh he is a nice guy oh, actually. After all yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll put it away. <laughs> um, one of the other things about the crowd that was there so it was 90,000 plus but that was only five days into the tournament because their main stadium, the Estadio Centenario, was not ready in time. And because of the, the weather as well with raining. So there were two other smaller stadiums where um, they ended up yeah, going to as well. Yeah, it was the well. grass hadn't grown properly, right? And so they thought that the studs would kind of dig it up. The cleats for American listeners would mm. kind of dig up the ground and... Was this because of the weather? Because one thing I read was that it had rained for 92 consecutive days before the first oh game God. of this World Cup. Wow. 92 oh. days. Which is... Oh, imagine the state of their reservoirs. Lovely. Yeah, gorgeous. <laughs> Lovely. Gorgeous. Very green lawns. Yeah. We could, we could <laughs> do with 92 garden. days of rain right yeah. now. But It's like that. Do you remember that summer when um, Rihanna's umbrella was in the charts and it rained for like three months nonstop here? Really? As well? it's, yeah, yeah. Is that why the song did so well there was a suggestion of that yeah it was i remember there was it was like they had real problems at wimbledon because they couldn't play mm. any of the matches because it just rained not stop and is there a right. suggestion that rihanna did some cloud seeding i think, maybe? Yeah. Well, I think there is wow yeah. i think the label did yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, she probably didn't know about she it she flew the cessna herself <laughs> <laughs> um chloroform, chloroform? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, thank you. I've, had some well, already. I've, got, I've got a sample here, and that's let's enough try of it. your chat up lines. <laughs> oh, um, so, yeah, chloroform. yeah, chloroform is um, it's really, really interesting stuff. In that, so I just love the story of how it was first used. Yeah. Um, it was first sort of properly introduced to surgery in the UK by a doctor called James Simpson from mm. Edinburgh. And before that, they were using ether, uh, but the dose is very hard to get right, and it doesn't, you know, it smells horrible and all of this. So, you know, chloroform was an improvement. And in 1847, Simpson had two other doctors who were called Keith and Duncan, their surnames, I think, uh, round to dinner. And they decided, he said, look, I've got this stuff. Do you want to try it? And they <laughs> tried it, yeah. got lightheaded, laughed a lot, and then all just fell unconscious. And then <laughs> someone came into the room and they were just I imagine out. one of them went, <laughs> your surname's also a first name. And we all went, ah, yours is as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they uh, actually had witnesses for the whole thing. It sounds like a, they had really fun parties, these mm. guys. And they'd spent an entire summer trying to find a better replacement for ether. So they'd spent an entire summer inhaling various concoctions of gases <laughs> round their yeah, dining room wow, tables, sort of collapsing. Mad and having fits and stuff and then they remembered that I've got this thing called chloroform that a friend told me about I think it's under some waste paper picked it out <laughs> they tried it and yeah apparently unwanted hilarity seized the party for a while and their conversation was of unusual intelligence <laughs> for a few minutes the and first woman who took it was actually at the party that night because there was there were family and friends there who were finding them all so charming and entertaining um, and so once they'd sampled it a few times the guests decided to say well can we have a go mm. and she apparently gallantly took her turn and then fell asleep while crying I'm an angel I'm an angel <laughs> oh. okay. so, actually I think she wasn't the first woman to take chloroform no sorry she maybe the, wasn't so this is the, so it had been discovered it was discovered about three times by three different people in the same month or so okay. um, and a lot of my I should say a lot of my facts of this come from a book called Chloroform by Linda Stratman which is great and rollicking absolutely knockout <laughs> again <laughs> on the cover quotes for the cover the, um, so Samuel Guthrie was a doctor in Massachusetts and he thought what he had was this thing called Dutch liquid which there was an existing mm. recipe for which involved
involved um, chlorine and, you know, he, chloric ether. So he had made it, but he'd, he'd kind of accidentally distilled it one extra time or there was an extra ingredient in the mix when he made it. So he had chloroform without knowing it. Uh-huh. But because he thought it was a known substance, which was already being used for medicine, he just kept some in his lab and would distribute bottles to friends and family. <laughs> and his uh-huh. daughter, who was eight-year-old Cynthia, would often run into the lab, dip her fingers in the liquid, taste it, and that was just a little treat for her. And on one occasion, <laughs> she took too much of it and she fell over completely asleep. Oh my God. And so she was probably the first person to be knocked out by chloroform. Amazing. Wow, <laughs> what a claim. Yeah. <laughs> and Stratman writes, it is probable that he simply assumed she was drunk. <laughs> it's all right, everyone. It's all right. My eight-year-old's drunk. She's not not to self out with chloroform. Don't worry. And what so, do we use it for today? Is it used still to put patients under? Because I no. just yeah. We use it for manufacturing. I think it's used to make Teflon. It's a and some pr- other sort stuff. of primer ingredient for Teflon. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But no, it sort of fell out of use. It, it started falling out of use in the 19th century because people started to question. It c- it's kills people. <laughs> yeah. Also, it got, I think it gets a bad press. Like it kills. <laughs> they did a massive study and found that it killed one in 2,500 of the patients that had been used on in oh. the 19th century, which it's not great, but it's not terrible for 19th century medicine. No. For 19th century, um, yeah. yeah. And then there was another study which found it killed like four in a thousand. But I think the four in a thousand one was done in the Civil War when everyone was quite injured uh, yeah. anyway. Right. So oh, yeah. you're not at your best. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what a yeah. journey it's had, you know, in yeah. terms of its repurposed uses. Like, if it was on Who Do You Think You Are? And you were like, your ancestor used to, like, kidnap people, you know? And <laughs> then you're... You, Is that something uh, to be proud of? Well, you, you, you know, in movies, yeah. that's the classic thing. Because used to fumigate grain. That's Does fun, it? Yeah, yeah. It's fun use God, of it. God, it actually feels like you've fallen from grace, from the great de- glory days of kidnapping and <laughs> curing people in the Civil <laughs> War. Settled down, you're now like a job. farmer. Yeah. Now so, you're yeah. in like the cooking industry with Teflon. Yeah. We don't know that anyone was really kind of kidnapped using it, right? Because mm. it's really hard to use. In yeah. That. We might have said this before, but basically you'd need the exact correct dosage. Mm. Um, otherwise, they would just feel a bit woozy or yeah. they would die. Yeah. You'd have to get the exact thing in between. And also it would take around five minutes. It takes minutes. Did it you even happen in movies, movies or is that one of those misnomers? Well, it, it, it happens in a Sherlock Holmes story. Okay. It happens and, in Dickens, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, oh, or Wilkie Collins, I think, that's maybe. That's weird, because Dickens' wife used chloroform to give yes. birth. Yes, so Dickens mm. was well into chloroform, oh, right? Okay. And it's in one of his books, and I can't remember which one it is, unfortunately, but... Um, it was in one of his books, but he doesn't call it chloroform because whenever the book was sent, set, it was before chloroform had been invented. Oh. So he talks about this kind of special thing which knocks someone out really quickly, but he doesn't specifically say it's chloroform. Oh, I wonder. Because he was so into chloroform, we're pretty sure that's what he meant. That's great. Right. Like you say, it is quite hard to administer. It does have this really yeah. dark Goldilocks um, phase where it works, and then on either side, it's a bit useless. But even so, there was this massive spate of crimes reported in the 40s. As soon as it became popular... 1840s. Um, in the 1840s. 1840s. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the forties. <laughs> sorry, the 40s? sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you assume. <laughs> <laughs> when I say the nineties, I'm usually referring to the seventeen nineties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Great, Your nineties okay. club night. How's it going, then? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of baroque music or something. I don't know. A lot of ether. A lot of fun, actually. Um, but yeah, there were things. Uh, there were all these stories about you know a handkerchief would be waved in the face of someone and they would collapse, or a lot of stories of women mm. coming up behind men and putting a handkerchief to their face. And women chloroforming men. Yes. Blow for equality. Uh, I know, <laughs> score, yeah. right? But there was one doctor, actually, who got so annoyed by all these stories by, I think, the 1850s or 60s, because mm. he said, this doesn't make any sense, it takes minutes and minutes for it to work, that he eventually soaked a handkerchief in chloroform and waved it in front of his aunt's <laughs> face until he was absolutely <laughs> exhausted of shaking to prove that it couldn't wow. do anything. Really? Right. That's oh, great. Was he proving that to his aunt? Uh, maybe though I don't know the argument that came right. before that when she <laughs> said <laughs> spoons yeah <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, Dan. Do you have a small business that's only firing on some of its cylinders? Only firing on some of it? Yes. It's called No Such Thing as a Fish, and it is, uh, <laughs> it's got a few weak members, one in particular. Oh, yeah? Who's that? Wears glasses, has a weird accent. Um, oh, you. I see. Yeah. I thought we I thought we were doing a bit of behind the scenes bitching about Andy Orana here. <laughs> I tried to, but my mouth just told the truth. It's me. 
<laughs> well, we obviously don't believe that, but if we did, and if we were looking for a new member of staff, then the place that we would go, of course, would be LinkedIn. That's right. So if you were looking to hire someone for your job, you can't go to a better place in the world than LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where all the professionals are hanging out, and if they're looking for a job, this is where they're searching for it. Absolutely. No amateurs. No charlatans. No charlatans. <laughs> Only professionals. And the reason that LinkedIn is so good is they have so many tools that you can use. So, for instance, they have special screening questions that make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience. If you're looking for someone who has podcasting skills and has been doing it for eight years, then you can find exactly that person. <laughs> I am on LinkedIn. Yes. Uh, so... If you want to take advantage of this amazing system that they've created for you to be able to hire the right person for your job, simply go to linkedin.com slash fish, and then you can post a job absolutely for free. Absolutely for free. Unbelievable. That's linkedin.com slash fish. You can post a job for free and terms and conditions apply. On with the show. <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number two, and that is Anna. My fact is that there's a group of astronomers called Solar Wind Sherpas who drag their equipment around the world to watch every single solar eclipse. <laughs> wow. Cool. I think these guys are so cool. Um, yeah. They've been going since 1995. So they visited every single eclipse since then. Eclipses happen. Total eclipses we're talking about yeah. once every 18 months. It was set up by this woman called Shadia Rifai Habal, who's a scientist. And yeah, they, they take all their equipment and they go and watch eclipses and they want to see the corona, which is the bit right. when you see a totality in an eclipse, you've got that little bit of ring of light around mm. it. And that's basically the um, stuff that the sun is emitting. Mm. And it's always too bright. The, sun, the rest of the sunlight is Hard too to bright for us usually to see it. Yeah. It must be hard for them to Google Corona these days. <laughs> it was always a struggle with the beer, but I think the last few years has made it a lot worse. Yeah. And so how long have they been doing this? How long have they been tracking? Since 95. Since 95. Yeah. Uh, and that's 1795. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. They're called Umbrophiles as well, aren't they? There's oh, shadow. Right. Uh, they got called nice. Coronaphiles, Eclipsaholics. Um, yeah, you don't want the Corona Files nickname catching on at this time, <laughs> no. do you? You really want to shed that. I got these from the website beinginthashadow.com, cool. which Ooh, is an eclipse really chaser. So it set that up. Who's seen 12 now? Cool. Who's seen 12? That's so cool. It's a lot. People yeah. get really into it. People yeah. Then, you know, they see their first one. You'd they? think if you've seen one eclipse, you've seen them all. I know I'm... Oh, <laughs> I know the um, <laughs> eclipse of files are going to come up <laughs> now. Yeah. I'm going to throw some shade. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I would have thought they were all the same. You'd mm. think so, but I guess it's such a unique event, even for our Well, obviously our not system. if they've seen 20 other of them. <laughs> no, like, I guess I mean it's like... It's a bit like saying your first cocaine high. Once you've done that, <laughs> I you've done it all, you know. <laughs> some people do, I guess, yeah. keep going back. They do yeah. chase them. They yeah. get addicted. They really get addicted. They, they do say it's a kind of transformative experience and they just, oh, they need it again. Yeah, well, Matt Parker, a buddy of ours, who's um, who's friend of the podcast, Steve Mould, who's on last week, uh, they're in a group together. He mm. goes chasing eclipses. Does he? Does yeah, he? sometimes on cruises with his wife because Lucy, his wife, is an actual solar physicist. She looks at coronal wow. mass ejection for her for her livelihood. And actually, just speaking of them as a couple, there's a thing that gets done with eclipses now. So it's called Bailey's Beads, right? And that is an actual phenomena of It's an like eclipse. a corona, but they're just really beads rather than a full circle. Exactly. It? It's, it's, so it looks like oh, diamonds. So when the moon is over the sun. When the moon is over the little, sun. Okay, okay. And it's to do with the fact that I believe because the moon obviously has bumps and lumps all over it, right. it's sort of like when the final bit of the eclipse is covered, a little bit will come through, a bit that's a bit lower. and So, so they look like little diamonds and people propose to their... But you won't be able to see you being proposed to. Oh yeah, good point. Because <laughs> it's a totality of an it's eclipse. Totality of an no, eclipse. That's so distracting. I'd definitely say no, regardless. You've only you got could... six minutes to watch it. But well, wait could... a minute, you can see people in the dark when there's a new moon or something. You can still see people. But I thought the whole point of a totality in eclipse was that you can't see anything. You can't see, of course you can. It doesn't go pitch black, Andy. There's Do still you stars, the for instance. When there's a solar eclipse. Yeah, it just goes quite dark, like yeah. a light night. Do you? 1999, we were all alive. Oh, yeah, but I, I wasn't in Cornwall, wherever it was. I actually was in Cornwall, and it wasn't that dark. 
It was quite dark, but you could make out someone proposing to you. If someone said, will you marry me? I wouldn't be groping around the front door. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Who says that? There are so many possibilities. Wow. Oh, okay. I thought it went really dark. Well, well the when there's no <laughs> moon at night time, you can still uh, make things out. You can still make out like well, shadows. I've stuff. got my phone torch on. Oh, yeah. and I guess, was that the thing when the when the because the last was it the last time a full eclipse was in the UK it was 1999 yeah. that mm-hmm. any, anywhere in the UK mm-hmm. wasn't I remember seeing footage of it and wasn't it lots of people were taking photos with flashes on their cameras at the time <laughs> it was just incredibly annoying because you know obviously you're trying to see yeah the that wonder been of the yeah yeah yeah. But, um, yeah you would have been the pain in the ass with a massive torch <laughs> 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 I've lost my diamond ring <laughs> there was a big solar eclipse in North America in 2017 but at that time they had a load of monitoring stations and they were checking the bees in North America. Ooh. And at the moment of complete pitch black, all of the bees went silent, apart from one bee. <laughs> there was one bee who buzzed. <laughs> No. And they don't know why. They this can't is a Disney out. film. I know. Fucking That's Eric. Really? Isn't that so funny? That's Just one B didn't get the memo. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Candace really Galen at the University of Missouri says that maybe he was slow getting back to the hive, or he was a bee with particularly good eyesight uh, who wasn't affected <laughs> right. by the eclipse. That's so funny. There was a story about a, s- a squirrel going nuts as well during the eclipse. Hey. Really? Like going really, really spitty. Yep. Sorry, I missed That's my own thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And afterwards, they were like, do squirrels go crazy in the eclipse? Or was it just the fact that we only saw one squirrel and we're basing all the knowledge now <laughs> on that? So on, on, on this point, there has been a study uh, from, from 2020 titled Total Eclipse of the Zoo, yeah. which oh, yeah. is all about how all the different animals in the zoo react. It's uh, not a pun. Yes. Why does that it's work a as pun. a pun? It doesn't rhyme with heart. It's not a pun. It's not a pun. It's a reference to eclipses. and um, But it's a it's reference, reference to, to the song. song. Yeah, it's a reference to the song, Total Eclipse. But it's, yeah, then yeah. it's a bad yeah. reference. If you're going to make a reference, make it a good reference. Total Eclipse of the... Yeah, what's now? Total Eclipse of the Heart, but you take out the E, and then you just study deer. That's good. That's really good. Uh, that is good. Well, they they wanted, I think, a slightly broader remit for their study. Um, <laughs> Total Eclipse of the Heart, <laughs> other deer, and <laughs> other animals. <laughs> like the, all sorts of animals, actually. Uh, warthogs, anecdotally, show no reaction to Total Eclipses. Um, <laughs> Komodo dragons move around a bit more than usual. Okay. Giraffes really? huddle together. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's so, good. You know. Spiders dismantle their webs. Yeah, how oh, weird's that? Well, the one like one specific species of spider, right? Yeah, yeah. the orb weavers. Yeah, just wow. takes it down. Total yeah. eclipse of taking your own web apart. There we go. Nice. It's closer. Lovely. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Much yeah. closer. <laughs> Oh dear! Uh, there was a from in August 2017. The I think this is the eclipse that you were talking about. Yeah, there yeah. was a story went round, which it turns out wasn't true, but it got picked up by everyone. We think it's we think it's not true. It's not confirmed entirely. Where a bunch of people were hospitalised because their eyeballs were really hurting because they weren't able to get their hands on the proper glasses that you right. would wear to use oh, to look at the eclipse. No. So instead they thought they'd put suntan lotion on their eyeballs <laughs> and that would help. No, that is not st- true. That's the story. No and it was reported stupid. by Forbes and Snopes tried to get to the bottom of it and they yeah. called up all the places. <laughs> they never heard back from the one lady who was quoted, uh, who was called Trish Patterson, okay. who gave a quote saying that this had happened. So it's inconclusive. Because people have sunglasses. I mean, that's the thing. But you these people didn't have sunglasses was the point but i mean normal sunglasses not special sunglasses because i know you can't get special are they lined with a particular yeah yeah they are but as andy says you would have thought before you go to the suntan lotion on the eyeball you would go for a pair of sunglasses (laughs) like an an ordinary (laughs) pair of sunglasses yeah but you might just be out in the beach that day or whatever you've got your suntan lotion you haven't got access to glasses you've forgotten there's a solar eclipse happening (laughs) you're gonna someone said you could use a ritz cracker because there's little holes in the ritz cracker so if you hold two ritz crackers to your eyes i don't think that works either does it no it 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 will it will it will still let the sunlight onto your retina to burn it I think you might be able to hold a Ritz cracker and then put a sheet of paper behind it and I reckon you'd see the... Mm. um... Because then the image of the sun appears on the paper... But yeah. don't put the cracker over your eyes. Well, look, lots to test out when the next <laughs> oh solar God. eclipse happens. I'd never thought of using a Ritz cracker for stuff like that, though. You could spy on people with a Ritz cracker. Or, like, you know when they have newspapers on a bench in a park as spies? <laughs> so I'm just yeah. holding up a Ritz cracker. Have, uh, yeah, hold I think the idea <laughs> is that you think someone's reading the newspaper, which is a completely normal thing that someone might do. <laughs> yeah. Whereas putting two Ritz crackers over your eyes <laughs> is going to automatically arouse suspicion. You'd have, to like, spend, you'd have to spend years normalising that as an yeah. activity. And there could be a really fun viral lag campaign Ritz Crackers did. Like the Ice Bucket Challenge. Challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But with putting Ritz Crackers over your eyes. Yes. Everyone does it. Thing. Yeah, Get yeah. Ritzy. Yeah. And then um, it's all part of the long game for the, that bench moment. If anyone from 
Ritz Crackers is listening. Or MI6. <laughs> or, <laughs> please do get in touch. The most unlikely brand partnership in history, Ritz Crackers <laughs> and MI6. Um, so mm. another famous eclipse chaser is Cecilia mm. Payne Gaposchkin. Uh, in 1919, when she was 19 years old, she went on a solar eclipse expedition to Africa. Uh, she later became the first woman to chair a Harvard department. So she's mm. a very famous academic. Uh, and she is the person who proved what stars are made of by spectroscopy uh, of the light emitted. So she worked Mm. out that it's made of helium and hydrogen, mostly all the stars, the sun and all stars. Um, Oh, so we only found that out? When did you say? In the early 20th century. Oh, early 20th century. Yeah, yeah. so before that, they thought it must be made of metal, some kind of, maybe some meteorites are flying into the sun Mm. and that metal kind of burns and burns and burns. That's what they thought. Anyway, she worked out that it was made of mostly hydrogen and she wrote this paper about it. Um, but everyone thought it was obviously bullshit. How on earth could that possibly be true that the stars are made of hydrogen and helium? And so when she wrote her thesis, at the very end, she wrote, this result is almost certainly not real. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, <laughs> because no. she wanted to protect her career. She thought that she if she did herself. this, yeah, she didn't back herself. And it would oh. be another 10, 20 years before people realized that that was true. That's terrible. Well, all you're hedging your bets and cheating, guys. You can't say, <laughs> no, oh, no. here's what I definitely think, except I'm maybe just joking. Um, have you guys heard of Donald Liebenberg? Donald Liebenberg from Clemson University in South Carolina, a very well-established umbrophile, eclipsaholic. (laughs) Call him what you will. Um, Nerd. (laughs) (laughs) So he's not seen more eclipses than anyone else. There is a group of people who, as of 2017, had seen 33 each, and they were the front runners, Uh which is a lot. Do you reckon there's going to be like a murder mystery where they all <laughs> knock each other off so that one person oh, has the most great idea. Yeah. or there's another eclipse but it's in that's a difficult the mo- place yeah. and they all stop each other from getting there and like it's a mad 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 world oh yeah yeah. yeah this is great yeah anyway Liebenberg he's okay riddle me this yeah he's not seen the most eclipses in the world he's only seen 26 yeah but he's spent more time in the totality of eclipse than anyone else even though other people have seen several more than him yes how can it be is he a pilot no, but you're so close to the right. Was oh, he on a plane? Hostess. He's an hostess. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> no, for the 1973 eclipse, which was on June 30th of that year, there was a group of eclipse experts who got on Concord. Yes, that's right. And they uh... followed the path of it, and they experienced 74 minutes of total eclipse at 1,000 miles an hour. Crazy. How cool is that? It is, is cool. It, is it, it also is a sign you've got too much money. Yeah. Um, but it, How did they cool. see where they were going, Andy? Surely. <laughs> well, obviously, the plane had a torch on its front, Dan. Planes have headlights, you know. But to me, right, the whole point of an eclipse is yeah. it's over in like six minutes, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like it's bright, and then the six minutes of weirdness, yeah. and then it's bright again. If you're going for 74 minutes, you might as well just fly at night time. Exactly. <laughs> but I think things might stay weird and get really weird. 79 minutes. You're you going might... to have to replenish the uh, suntan on your, um, <laughs> sun- on your eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually I was wondering about the glasses um, oh, yeah. for people who can well, get the hold of them ones. the special ones and um, I found out that there's a, a company called American Paper Optics who are the main producers of them in America and their revenue doubles in years of solar eclipses wait a minute oh. what are people it, buying you'd think, more than, you'd think it would more than double you would <laughs> you'd think it would be an enormous spike in those years and quite lean in the other years they make other types of glasses as well <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> Um, they make 3D glasses, so most of their custom is cool. like you know, and okay. uh, you go cinemas. to 3D cinemas or you sell them in cereal packets, or right. they're mostly freebies that they hand out, so they get branding deals with companies. But in like in 2017, for instance, their revenue went from seven million to 14 million dollars. That's doubling, and that's that's <laughs> doubling. That's what doubling is. <laughs> and they prepared for two and a half years for wow. the 2017 eclipse. They doubled their staff. And um, the guy well, who Well, they runs... could afford to, couldn't they, with all that double revenue they were counting on? <laughs> it works out perfectly. Yeah. That's good projection. Um, and they, the guy who runs the company is a guy called John Jarrett, who seems to be really obsessed with eclipses. He actually got his big glasses break in the cardboard glasses world. In 1991, when this astronomer got in touch and said, there's going to be an eclipse. Can you make some glasses for me? I mm. hear that you make cardboard glasses. Um, and it ended up being a massive deal. And he sold a million glasses to Corona Beer in 19- 1991 no. when the eclipse no. was in Mexico clever and I think oh, wow. it must be that Corona because of the Corona and the Corona yeah. perfect partnership yeah 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 mm. 
genius brilliant that's very good yeah there was you know we we spoke about solar eclipses not on a podcast but on a book 2017 our book of the year oh yeah we had literally our scripted conversation in there oh yeah and there's a great fact in there which is that nasa has two accounts which is nasa moon and at nasa sun and um on the day of the eclipse nasa moon blocked <laughs> nasa sun <laughs> on, on twitter. twitter yeah that's so brilliant <laughs> Okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that in 1906, there was a music streaming service which involved just two people playing keyboards down the telephone. Ooh. Yeah. So, so would I ring up and I'd immediately get piano music played at me? You would, yeah. yeah so this was was a, there someone waiting for a call, basically, and whenever the phone rang, they'd have to answer it and start playing <laughs> the piano know, at me. No, it, this okay. this is phenomenal <laughs> when you think about the sort of the scale of what this person had built. So this was a lawyer called Thaddeus Cahill, and uh, he's 1867 to 1934, and at the end of the 1800s, he decides he wants to invent a machine whereby if you called up this one phone number you would get music just streaming to you and it was a subscription model so he was going to sell it to hotels and restaurants and so on what you would do is you would hold a paper funnel to the phone receiver so that would act as your amplifier to the room that you were playing it out to and i think in answer to your question that they would be just playing bach or whatever and whenever you phone them up you would get whatever they're playing at the time so if they're playing chopsticks you'd get chopsticks so he basically invented the concept of muzak sort of background music that can just be playing but he to do this he invented a machine which was called the telharmonium which was as big as the office space that we're in right now, a ginormous room in Manhattan. All these. Can I just say, Dan? Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, people at home don't know what the QI office is like. So I think at the moment they're imagining like an aircraft hangar well, or yeah. something. <laughs> we now have clips on YouTube. You can watch it You're to see so the right. size You're of so our. Right. It weighed two hundred tons. It weighed two hundred tons, yes. and it was you know. sixty feet long. So it's actually significantly longer than the bit of the office that you can currently see now if oh, you are yeah. watching it on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A picture more feet the other way from the uh, video they had all these phone lines that would be um, hanging in front of basically a ginormous gramophone horn which was the music is what was being pumped through I mean it's very complicated to get your head around what this machine was but effectively what Cahill had invented was the first synthesizer it was yeah. electronic music I love the the way of um, explaining how complicated all the wires were and stuff the Republican and Herald newspaper in Pennsylvania in 1907 started off explaining how it works and then said it would be useless to describe the more complex principles of the telharmonium because it would require diagrams and mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with him. It that's... really sounds like one of Dan's relatives. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, what's the surname of that? <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, this was in Manhattan, as I say. It was located on Broadway and 39th Street. It took up an entire floor of the building. Um, he called it the Telharmonic Hall. He also called it the music plant, and he advertised it as the music of AD 2000, Ooh, which is really cool, really sci-fi. Yeah. He knew he was yeah, onto yeah. something that was kind of looking into the future. Now, there's no radio at this point. This guy is decades ahead of any other kind of broadcasting yeah. of just playing music out. And there was a rumor that this was all generated, this music, by two people who would supposedly play for 24 hours. That was said in passing in an in a article, oh, so okay. there's no confirmation on PR, that. Might be a PR. Yeah, but the music yeah. was being played by people. And supposedly, this is where I get confused, could emulate sounds like the flute or... Yeah, well, it was I, electronic. That but, was why it was how, so amazing. Yeah, but how? Did they record the... No, no, no in- you add... So I, I thought this was really interesting because I've never known how, like when you get an electric keyboard and you press a button that plays a cymbal or whatever, yeah. how do they do it? And it's basically just you add lots of harmonics to one tone so another amazing thing about this is it wasn't a normal musical instrument Mm. it was an electronic instrument so i think if you stood next to it i'm not quite sure how the gramophone horn bit worked because if you stood next to it you couldn't hear it play i don't think you could only hear it play when the electrical signals were transmitted through cables and they were interpreted into sound at the other side and the electrical signals uh through this very complex system you could overlay lots of different notes on top of each other so you'd have like the main note but then they worked out that the reason a trumpet sounds different to like a violin is because there are kind of like harmonic sounds overlaying that main note that's insane Um, it is unbelievable i'd love to know how realistic it was well the other thing is that on top of what anna's saying there's quite a lot more, but it would be kind of difficult to explain without mathematics. And mm. So it probably yeah. won't go into all that stuff now. 
yeah. and we don't have any recordings this is no. the other thing and we, it doesn't exist and it, it doesn't exist it was anymore. dismantled yeah. it was sold for scrap it's incredibly tragic um and there were complaints as well so the, the it, it interrupted other transmissions at various points. Yes, the, so many complaints. The U.S. Navy complained that they had secret wireless transmissions, which they'd like to hear, but they were getting Rossini overtures instead. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the telharmonium. Yeah, it interrupted yeah. phone calls uh, yeah. a lot. I mean, that was one of the pr- reasons that it didn't succeed in the end um, was that there were just so many problems with it. People would yeah. be on the phone and music would bleed in. And in fact, I read one newspaper article from the time saying it had almost broken up a marriage because a oh. husband had called his wife to say he was working late in the office. Uh, but she heard the William Tell Overture playing in the background. So of course said, bullshit are you in the office, mate? You're out at a concert. Yeah. Having sex to the William Tell Overture. The US Navy one, I think, by the way, later on, I think in 1911, he worked with a guy called DeForest and they came up with a new system that was basically the telharmonium, but instead of going through telephone lines, they would use radio technology. Oh. Uh, and it was when the US Navy was using radio technology as well, they would get that kind See. of thing. Yeah. So it was a later bit of his career where he was working on something else, where he was still interrupting. He was still getting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so good. And it, mu- it must have been good because it did get good reviews. So we, we don't have any samples of it anymore. But Mark Twain basically said he would postpone his death just to hear it again. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I yeah. mean, how was confident he, was he that he yeah, could do that? Exactly. He just, that sounds like you're in a situation where someone's about to kill you and you're like, no, no, just one second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah. just want to listen to the William Tell of Char yes. one more time. <laughs> a last, yeah, like a last meal, a last song. Um, so he was quoted, he went yeah. to a recital, basically. He was invited to go to one and he said, every time I see or hear a new wonder like this, I have to postpone my death right off. I couldn't possibly leave the world until I've heard this again and again. And so in 1907, at this point, the plan of Cahill was that he wanted to put it into uh, places like, as I said, hotels and restaurants, but he couldn't get it into people's homes. And Twain managed to work out that he could get it into his home because of his celebrity status and so on. And so um, the Times reported that he was going to glory in the fact that he would be able to rejoice over other dead people when he died in having been the first man to have telharmonium music tuned in his house like gas. Twain, Twain seemed to really, really, really like it. He yeah. said he wanted street lights to be connected to it, which would play the funeral march during his funeral oh, as wow. his funeral procession went He's quite out. obsessed with death, doesn't he, Mark Twain, at the <laughs> yeah, moment? Yeah, yeah. He was getting old by this point, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Bloody so. annoying meeting him in the afterlife, immediately going, yeah, in your face, I heard the telharmonium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you do know that got dismantled after two years, don't you? And no one ever heard of it ever again. <laughs> what? <laughs> so this, there was an earlier thing called the... Theatrophone in 1881 and that played it was in Paris and it was the theatrophone and it transmitted music but also some theatrical productions over the phone cool yeah. no hang on a second did phones exist in 1881 yeah yeah, yeah. They? there were quite a few there it's... was only one <laughs> <laughs> now there were some in 18 oh, okay yeah, yeah. Um, when was it in 1870 was I that think, when bell yeah, patented yeah, yeah. it it's or... early isn't it yeah well because yeah. people thought with the phone weirdly they thought the phone was going to be used for mass entertainment Amazing. and they sampled this loads of times so yeah there was the 1881 thing um there was i think the longest running most successful version of mass entertainment via phone was the telephone newspaper and this was in Hungary and it was invented in 1893 and it ran until 1944 wow. and it was a Whoa. subscriber service and you just called it whenever and you got either it started off just being a news service so you called it and they tell you the news yeah. um, but then it was music performances uh, there were you know like fun new pop songs whatever right. you played when was comedy this? shows 1893 so was it a live program or yeah. so you didn't requ- it wasn't so you, request you, didn't, you had to tune no. in at let's say noon for the headlines exactly and, and if you missed the headlines you might get the column later on or yeah. the well, crossword yeah or, there was no yeah. record option you can go to it later on <laughs> yeah. um, that's brilliant that's incredible yeah. even in the 1920s 10,000 people were signed up to the system in wow. Hungary where you called up to get your that's news that's amazing but do you remember when the internet first started and it was through telephone lines and then whenever anyone was making a call you couldn't use the internet yes well it would be the same here if someone was listening to the news you wouldn't be able to make a call that would be really annoying wouldn't it yeah in 1896 telephone wires were laid between buckingham palace and a bunch of concert halls in london so that the royal family whenever they wanted to could listen to a concert without having to because it was a bit lowering to go into a music hall for instance if you're the queen victoria uh, you know, you a music hall. I mean, it. you definitely wouldn't go into a music hall. Even having a phone line laid to a music hall is, I think, a bit undignified. 
Wow, because... you are the, one of the snobs of the 1890s. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, if, there, if, there's a, if there's a raucous, naughty performance, maybe you can't see her getting naked as well. She's probably just enjoying the... Da, 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 da. It's a great tune. But you, I guess if... Yeah, it depends on the venues, I suppose. As in some venues, I'm sure, were very reputable. Oh, there must have been some reputable music hall. Well, was... she wasn't doing a phone call to some something <laughs> proper pub in Soho. It's, it's, it's going to be a guinea a minute for this phone call, Mom. Are you sure? <laughs> it wasn't a sex line, okay. But Sorry, it was... Right. So so that... <laughs> she also Queen Victoria didn't have a sex line installed in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> we, not that we know of, okay. but we can't be sure. <laughs> but it was for the slightly more improper performances that it wouldn't do to be seen at. Who wow, knows? Really? That's so cool. On uh, music platforms these days. Okay. Oh, yeah. So obviously, you know, huge music platforms, all over, you know, like Spotify and yeah, things like that. One growing and rapidly growing music platform is Peloton Bikes. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hmm. like they've all got they've got licensing deals and they've got their own in-house music department specifically to license. Uh, oh, do you mean exercise know. bikes? The brand Peloton. Yeah, 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 yeah. As in, they, yeah. as in, <laughs> not anyone in the Tour de France. <laughs> 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 who's not in, anyone who's not in the lead, but in the main group. They there's have the, to carry a big boot. Yeah, there's <laughs> the um, well, there's the yellow headphones, and whoever's in the lead on the Tour de France yeah, gets yeah. to listen to the music. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but the the pr- Prince, as in the musician Prince, yeah, dead now. But uh, the Grateful Dead, confusingly, I think a lot of him is still alive. <laughs> and um, and Beyonce, they've all licensed their music specifically to Peloton for massive amounts of money. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because it gets yeah. used in the exercise classes. Yeah. So this is the forefront of streaming is exercise bikes, basically. But it's not ex- it's not exclusive tracks, is it? No, it's... you can still get them on Spotify. Yeah. yeah, 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 you can. But you can't... So in the early days, I think Peloton was just using a lot of the music in their mm. exercise classes. Yeah. And obviously, they're making money out of these exercise classes. And I think it was a big old... The big old fuss about it. Well, yeah. that's a big. I mean, I think we've said that Guitar Hero, with certain yeah. bands like Aerosmith, were making more money from the licensing deal that they exactly. did for that mm. than they would make yeah. on their records. Yeah, that's a big industry now. Would you want to? I don't know much Grateful Dead. I know a bit of Prince, and it's weird, and I don't know if I'd want to cycle to it. Beyonce can totally see the cycling. It's uh, very, I think, yeah, she's really the queen of uh, of Peloton. You know? Yeah, you can get Beyonce themed classes. Really? Specifically to do on your bike. Right. Yeah, nice. And riding a bike, of course, gives you an amazing ass, which is what she already has. So <laughs> that's something point. to strive for while you're riding. Yeah. I just see that from someone who cycles a lot, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, you basically cycle every day and you're like, you know what? People who cycle, <laughs> amazing ass. <laughs> My God, that is rock hard. <laughs> I'm sitting on two boulders right now. <laughs> Okay, it's time for our final fact of the show, and that is Andy. My fact is that Australian Aboriginal people sometimes built objects specifically to arouse the curiosity of emus. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice of them. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't nice of them. Oh. It was oh. naughty. Well, it wasn't naughty either. It was just a spicy. Well, as they say in Australia, <laughs> curiosity killed the emu. Yeah, mm. exactly, and it did kill the emu in this case but the unborn emus in the that egg that feels worse oh <laughs> it's in an egg uh. <laughs> well this is maybe the worst way I've ever introduced the fact <laughs> on the show <laughs> there are these things they're called emu callers and aboriginal peoples would build them they're cylinders of carved wood and when you bang the end with the flat of your hand it produces a sound which apparently is reasonably like the noise of a female emu and this is it has to be a female emu as well because with emus the male is the one who sits on the eggs mm. and you know nurses them towards um, incubates them that's the thing uh, and so one hunter will hide in the bush playing this thing making the noise of a female uh, banging away and the male will say oh a female emu and go and explore hmm. and then um, mm. his colleague the man in the bush's colleague will steal the emu's eggs without being pecked to death and that is absolutely the name of the game when you're hunting yeah. and so then you've got a lovely emu omelette feed four people feed four people yeah. uh, and the other way yeah. it was used sometimes is to distract a mob of females uh, and it would move that you can move them to one place where you want them to go so you can shoot them so that oh. was, it was used by hunters sometimes as well okay. but I yeah. will say the father in Andy's case kind of had it coming because he was going to cheat on the mother of his children right yeah but you know what's happening at the same time like when a male emu is incubating the eggs <laughs> the woman's off shagging other emus yeah. it's it's true. and <laughs> not only that she shags the other emu gets a baby in an egg and then slips in under the other father yeah Does look, she, it's all really? complicated there's, there's no no wow. villain in this piece. Oh, no, <laughs> no villain. I thought the male was the villain a moment ago, Anna. 
<laughs> she can store sperm as well, right? Like multiple different sperm no. that she can then refertilize. She's got a sort of larder. I, I believe know so. That. Can I, she? That's what I read. It but sounds like Dan's saying there's a kind of cupboard inside the female emu. That's where, kind of how it works. But yeah. could she select, I think I'll have a little bit of Tony today and then fertilize from him? I don't think so. I don't think there's okay. a sort of like spice <laughs> shelf. <or different. laughs> But the male doesn't eat or drink or defecate during the incubation of the eggs, yes. which is fifty-six days. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to judge him for for hearing a female and thinking. <laughs> oh, I wonder. Well, so he doesn't have time to poo, but he does have the time to <laughs> shag another female. Yeah, it's all about priorities. <laughs> yeah. life, isn't it? How appealing is he going to be to that female? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hasn't showered in fifty days. Bowels on leash immediately. <laughs> There's a slight advantage for the males, I think, when the females can bring other eggs back and make him incubate them, even though they don't belong to him. Oh, interesting. Because if he's sitting on his own eggs, but also some other dad's eggs, if the eggs get attacked, at least it raises the chances that someone else's kids will be lost. Oh, okay. That's pretty dark. I suppose one of the the things is (laughs) the first eggs to hatch will be his eggs, right? Because he was the first one there. And that means that when all of the kids have hatched his will be the oldest and perhaps the strongest oh yeah right. Right. Cool. so that might help as well because he does the male looks after the chicks for mm. i think about seven months it's a long old time right. that the male is doing the the carry after and sometimes we'll take on other chicks which got lost from other broods yeah right this um object that they make mm. um if you can imagine a didgeridoo yep it's like a small didgeridoo yeah yep. uh, and it's sometimes known as a woman's didgeridoo uh, oh. because it's a small version of it mm. uh, and they're made in the same way so they're not necessarily made by the humans they're kind of naturally made by ants eating out yeah. the middle of a mm. trunk and, yeah. yeah and then decorated Very and they cool. do sound if you listen to a didgeridoo so i haven't heard um what the emu caller sounds like but i imagine it's a slightly higher pitched version of a didgeridoo mm-hmm. they do sound a bit like emus like the emu noise is very kind of uh, like something grunting underwater i thought <laughs> yeah which is a little bit like a didgeridoo right but it's not the only way to attract an emu um, <laughs> if you're in the business. Really? Yeah. I was uh, no, reading... There must be myriad ways. Oh, yeah. God, there are a lot of ways. Mm. Yeah. Des Fallon called himself the world champion emu caller in the 90s. I can't find any official record of that. I think it might have just been self-styled. Mm. Um, but he said, and this does work, and lots of people do it now, you lie on your back <laughs> yeah. and you wave your legs in the air, kind of like a turtle that's been turned over, and you sort of make a noise like a strangled cat, sort of grunting noise and halfway between it being in pain and being in love i think one researcher said i heard a slightly different version or Mm -hmm. take on that which is that you lay on your back and you put one leg in the air with your foot oh i heard yeah in that position that it looks like it's an emu's head and it confuses the emu into thinking it's another emu and it comes over to investigate because they're so stupid apparently they're so stupid according to a big research study that was done i can tell you that emus do really like uh, they like shiny objects a lot so if you put a disco ball in a tree, yeah. emus will stare at it for hours on end. Really? really? Hours on end. And, Do um, they dance? A bit of macarena? Well, I think the, there, this has been a similar thing has been used in hunting them. So again, uh, traditional Aboriginal hunters will, will lure emus by hanging a ball of emu feathers and rags from a tree, mm. which I guess must catch the light. Or I mean, it certainly yeah. looks weird and it's an unusual object to them. And they just gather around it and are captivated, at which point you can throw a spear at them and, and kill them. Is that not because they're all going, hang on, we're flightless. How did that even <laughs> get up the tree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's yeah. cracked it. Yeah. <laughs> Barry, tell us the trick. Come on. <laughs> That's so good. They can't fly. They do when they run. They still sort of wave their... They're tiny little wings oh, that they have. Hey. They think they, they're not fully sure why they do this from the article I read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the suggestion is it's a balance thing to help them with okay. the speed because they yeah, can go yeah. very, very fast. Um, but I did read that when they have, because they have predators like dingoes and eagles and so on in Australia. Mm. And one way that they fight against a dingo is they leap into the air and they just start stomping them, mm. sort of like just jumping cool. on their head and shoving them into the ground. They've got claws. <laughs> nice. But it's just, just such a yeah, wonderful they look very fighting style. Tough. The tantrum. It's yeah, the toddler yeah. tantrum. <laughs> just on emu um, penises... Yeah. Oh, which they, yeah, which are rare. But oh no, sorry, they're are not they? rare for emus. Every emu, <laughs> every emu, <laughs> but no one emu else has an emu penis. Oh, so about half of emus have an emu penis. Yeah. Nobody else has an emu penis. <laughs> okay, but birds with penises are rare. Yeah, because okay. ninety-seven percent of bird species don't have them, and emus are in the rare. But they don't have 
blood in their penises or when they have an erection it doesn't fill up with blood it fills with lymphatic fluid Mm. Ah. which is very unusual and it's also low pressure yeah so So they they can't keep an erection for very long okay but what one interesting thing about that is that the other birds that have penises also a lymph based yeah and so that means that the earliest ancestor of these two lineages of penis birds yeah must have also had a limp lymph <laughs> penis <laughs> yeah. um, and that what that means is that it was sometime a long time ago and what came before the birds the dinosaurs and so if we ever find out that a dinosaur had a penis and at the moment we haven't found it in the fossil record but mm-hmm. if we ever do there's a good chance that it would also be a lymph based ah interesting. wow wow yeah i saw a picture of an incredible penis the other day and it was sent to okay. me by john bastard snell the explorer <laughs> was it <Yeah>. his? <laughs> <laughs> you really should probably block him his only fans account is really really cool <laughs> um this is a great explorer um he's a friend of the podcast and he he took he showed me a picture of a bat that he'd caught yeah. out i think it was in the Amazon somewhere, ginormous. Like it looked like it was as tall as really? us. Basically. Did he catch it by the penis? He might as well have, because this bat was hung like unlike anything I've seen. It was like a human penis on a oh on God. a bat. It was insane. Really? <laughs> I'll show you the photo later. It's truly extraordinary. Oh, I'm all right, actually. Are you okay, yeah. Andy? I'll, 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 uh, I'll give it to you. Um, Thank you. I wonder because they hang upside down a lot. I'm just trying to think. It of... would just keep bashing them in the uh, face. Yeah. <laughs> if it was windy. <laughs> <laughs> Wind chimes. Uh, did you, you guys read the emu story from earlier this year? No. It was only a month ago, I think. It was uh, Malmesbury in Wiltshire. Mm. Where I used to live. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. Very exciting. Uh, exciting. I wish I'd still lived there for this story. Then. Well, there was a man who crashed his car into a shop front. And uh-huh. he was he was with a, an accomplice. Uh, right. And he ran away from the scene of the crash. Because uh-huh. he, he was incredibly drunk and incredibly high, I think. And basically, in charge of a car, crashed it into a building legged it yeah and the chef of the local hotel was a guy called dean wade saw him do this thought i'm not letting someone get away with that that's terrible yeah chased after him they ran away they ran for quite some distance and they ended up at the edge of the local wildlife enclosure which has a field full of emus right and dean wade shouted don't go in there there are emus and the guy said i'm going in there i'll take on the emus and the emus absolutely they pecked him a new one. They really, <laughs> they really went for him. Really? He got. He, he, he tro- shouldn't have lain on his back and flailed around <laughs> with his legs yeah. in the air. He was trying to do kung fu kicks and karate chops on this emu, and the emu was absolutely just dodging all of it and pecking and pecking and pecking oh, him. No. Yeah, and he was apprehended. This man. I, I think we're this. crediting the emu with the apprehension, right? Because the fact that this guy, the chef. <laughs> It was still in full chef's garb. He <laughs> knew that the emus could take care of it, so he was then yeah. free to go um, get the police. Was he sort of shepherding them towards the emus? I'm not sure if it was a deliberate conscious thought, but I think when it happened, he thought, that's a right, stroke of luck. Is he if- okay, this guy, or...? I think but, he's fine. Yeah, he's been around. He's, he lived. I wonder if the chef was torn to get the police or to then go and steal the eggs from the, uh, <laughs> yeah. from the nest. Because <laughs> yeah. that would be yeah, great for right. the hotel. Have we ever done the emu war? Yeah, we have. Have we on have the we? show? No, it, was in, it was in International Factball, which I think isn't canon. <laughs> Isn't it? Well, the interesting oh, that's a thing discussion. about it is when we mentioned it, did we mention that it's basically a myth? Is it? No, no way. Yeah. Oh, really? So the idea is that, you know, Australia went to war against emus and lost. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's and the story. Far be it from me to back up the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that basically it was one Western Australian governor did declare war on the emus, mm. but didn't send all of his guys out there. He sent three people. <laughs> out to attack all these emus uh three men a pickup truck and two machine guns and that was against twenty thousand emus (laughs) (laughs) and basically what had happened was there had been the war the second world war and the australian government had given land to a lot of veterans Uh, but the land was really dry it was really barren they couldn't really grow anything apart from wheat Uh, and the emus loved wheat so the emus were going after the wheat and the governor of western australia decided well we're going to declare war on them and we're going to shoot them well because they've got all these veterans living there well that's what they thought they thought we'll send three of our actual army guys Mm. and we'll get all of the veterans (laughs) to come in as well Um, but actually really i mean there was no chance that they were ever going to do anything i think that it was major meredith who was the guy in charge of them and he said Basically, the birds could keep running even after they'd been shot. And so there was very little chance of them winning this engagement. Well, the other Um, thing is, like, if you had a big mob of emus, let's say there's 100 in a mob, 
as soon as you shot them, they split up into two fifties, and it was yeah. like the gremlins <laughs> when they get water again. And again. And then you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like being just... attacked by a worm, and you chop yes. it in half, and you just keep yeah. making it work. And Meredith said after it, he said, if we had a military division with the bullet carrying capacity of these birds, it would face any army in the world. <laughs> wow. yeah. yeah, yeah. And the, really, the reason that it became a big deal is because it was the time of the Great Depression, and the Great Emu War was kind of a funny story that they could have in the newspapers all the time. Yeah, it's, right. And it is funny. And it, I mean, it's it funny. Is, yeah. yeah. Well, that's Amazing good. That's not quite true. That's I feel incredible. like Aussies get so much crap for the Emu Wars. So now there you go. You can come back at people yeah. with. So, we only sent yeah. three old blokes in there. Exactly. And I have to say, on Twitter, this is probably the most requested story that people send to me saying, really? have you guys oh, ever it? spoken about the Emu War? It's just oh. constantly. In... So there you go. You're welcome, Australians. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Considering you cheat so much at cricket, you Outrageous. should be very glad that I <laughs> said <Unbelievable. this. laughs> Okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, Andy, at Andrew Hunter M, James, at James Harkin, and Anna. You can email podcast.qi.com. Yep, or you can go to our group account, which is at No Such Thing, or our website, No Such Thing as a Fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there, also linked to this final bit of the Nerd Immunity Tour, which we will be starting at the end of this month. It's only a few days. Uh, check it out see if we're in a city near you do come along and also why not join Club Fish the exciting new exclusive membership club for all the listeners of our show where you can get ad free episodes as well as exclusive extra content like Drop Us a Line our new show where we talk about all the correspondence and all the facts that have been sent into us it's really fun do check it out it's on Patreon it's also on Apple Podcasts uh, so yeah join Club Fish otherwise stay here for all the free episodes that will keep coming every single week no such thing as a fish. That's us. You know us. We'll be back again. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>